So I've talked uh, in, in depth uh, a bit about the Chiari 2. So on the left, this is an example of a sagittal T2 MRI scan um, in a child with uh, uh, myelomeningocele who underwent postnatal closure. And you can see the significant uh, herniation of the cerebellar tonsils into the subaxial cervical spinal canal. And associated with this is, is herniation of the brainstem contents. And that's unique uh, to, to Chiari 2 patients in general. You can certainly see it in a setting of what's called a Chiari 1.5, but I wouldn't concern yourself with a, a nuance like that. On the right, this is actually uh, a patient that has a open neural tube defect that was closed postnatally and doesn't have a Chiari 2 malformation. So you can see see that there is a wide range here. And the reason that a Chiari 2 malformation is, is really significant and causes morbidity is because the, the brainstem, as you all know, is really the relay center for, for everything. And it can control the respiratory center or cardiovascular center. And several of the brainstem nuclei are in this area too. So if there's any kind of molestation in this region, and, and that includes abnormal CSF dynamics, compression at the foramen magnum, it can cause dysfunction in one of these areas. So children that have a symptomatic Chiari 2, and they're typically symptomatic with lower cranial nerve dysfunction and require ventil ventilatory support, or support, they suffer from central sleep apnea, and they may even be trach- uh, or vent dependent, these kids can, can get very sick um, if their Chiari 2 uh, uh, kind of rears its, its head in, in what's called a Chiari 2 crisis. So those kids in my mind are, are very sick and need urgent attention if those come to your, to your clinic or your ER. When we talk about shunt malfunction and, and failure, you know, we, we tell people that within five years, 50% of, of children who have a shunt require some kind of shunt operation. Now, that may be a bit lower uh, now based on some of the more recent data that's published, but in general, this is still a number that's very commonly used. And uh, children who have myelomeningocele who require a shunt are often very shunt dependent. This is an example of a, a teenage uh, boy who uh, a right-sided scan showed a, a well-appearing scan. Um, you can see small ventricular spaces. The left scan shows a, a very ill teenager, same kid in the ER, nausea, vomiting, bradycardic, um, and concerning for acute hydrocephalus. And you can see there's not much change in the ventricular caliber or size. And you might look at this and say, no, oh, this looks okay. You know, look at another source, but it's always important to look at a failure your scan and, and, and see what a baseline scan looks like. And this child was taken to surgery and was under significant pressure, underwent a shunt revision and was discharged home in, in completely normal condition the same day. So shunt failure can, can present quickly, it can present rapidly and, and sometimes fatally. And so you have to have a high index of suspicion um, in, in these children. When we talk about other late chronic conditions, uh, spinal cord tethering, and this is something we'll talk about in depth with some of the closed neural tube defects as well, but I wanted to introduce the topic here. By definition, children that have undergone a closure of a myelomeningocele, their MRI has the appearance of a tethered cord, meaning that their conus is going to be at a low-lying level because of their congenital abnormality. So you, this, this is a picture of a child on the right, a sagittal T2 MRI scan. You can see the conus medullaris. It's a little hard to make out probably on the screen, but it ends really towards L4, L5. And so uh, when someone undergoes an MRI and say they have a tethered cord, I don't uh, particularly jump because tethered cord is not just a diagnosis of, of radiographics. It's a clinical diagnosis. And you'll hear that through and through your neurosurgery training moving forward. Symptoms of spinal cord tethering can be, can be uh, quite broad. Uh, they include scoliosis or curvature of the spine, changes in muscle tone, uh, weakness, uh, spasticity, uh, changes in urinary uh, function or bowel function, um, and things like that. So when we see children in a multidisciplinary spinal clinic uh, or spinal anomalies clinic, as it's uh, called in some institutions, these are all things that we ask about. It's not just, oh, do you have headaches? How's your shunt working? Let's take an MRI scan. It's a myriad of symptoms that really require both a clinical evaluation and radiographic confirmation or adjunct more than anything. 
everyone, Ryan Rad here from NeurosurgeryTraining.org. If you like that video, subscribe and donate to keep our content available for medical students across the world.